Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. I'm Dr. W.F. Strong. I'm your host. And today we have a wonderful book for you. The book is called Cured, How the Berlin Patients Defeated HIV and Forever Changed Medical Science. It's written by Nathalia Holt, Dr. Nathalia Holt, who uh, got her PhD at Tulane and uh, USC. And then she uh, did postdocs at Harvard and MIT, where she's been involved in um, this kind of research for quite some time. And this is a wonderful book. If you liked uh, um, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, you'll love this book. If you liked um, Dallas Buyers Club, you'll love this book. Welcome, Nathalia. How are you this morning? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, your book comes out at a great time uh, in, in concert with the uh, Academy Awards for, uh, you know, Dallas Buyers Club. It brings attention to this issue, the historical nature of it, and your book does the same. Yes, it's, it's interesting to look back at the history of HIV because what we learn from it, what we learn from Dallas Buyers Club and from things I've written in my book is that what happened then means much more for medicine than just HIV. It, it really changed how people approached clinical trials. It changed how people viewed patient access and patient rights. So it's a real turning point, not just for HIV, and HIV but for medicine in general. I remember the time very well, uh, having lived through it, and how uh, there was a period of extraordinary fear over the um, what they called at the time the AIDS epidemic and uh, the fear that it could be spread by air and the fear that uh, that you could get it simply by touching people uh, and so there was even talk I remember at the time of taking uh, people with AIDS and uh, or who are HIV positive and putting them in essentially you know concentration camps in Utah or something um, yeah. so I'm sure that you have read about all of that. I have. You know, it's it's interesting when you look back at that because it it just seems so crazy now, doesn't it? That yes. You had hospitals that wouldn't see HIV positive mm-hmm. patients. There was so much fear. You, know, you had emergency workers, you had firefighters that were afraid to to come across patients they saw on the street, and it's just it's hard to imagine a time like that now that there was so much stigma and it was such a difficult time for people living with HIV. Now, you've seen the movie, The Buyer's Club? I have, yes. So what did you think? I thought it was a great movie. Mm-hmm. It, it's In some ways, it was a little bit hard on AZT. Mm-hmm. AZT, we have, uh, it's a complicated history we have with that drug mm-hmm. because it was the first drug that was approved for HIV. It, it did give us some success, but it also did kill people. Mm-hmm. It was given in these very high doses, and it was difficult for people to get access to. Um, but it's actually a drug that's still around today and that we found that when given in smaller doses, it's one of the few drugs that we know is safe in pregnancy and in children. I didn't know that till I read that in your book, that AZT is one of the few drugs that you can give to pregnant women. Yes, and in fact, it's, it's a drug that, that's also been given in a functional cure of a child in Mississippi. So it's interesting because it is a drug that I think reveals a lot of what's wrong with access to care and access to medicine um, and in drug development. But it's also a drug that was sort of our, our first stab at HIV and is still used today. People use the words AIDS and HIV interchangeably, but they're different, right? Yes. So HIV is the virus mm-hmm. and AIDS is is the disease itself. So okay. it's it's if you if you don't control HIV, then you progress to AIDS. So most of the people who use the word AIDS, they use it just uh, as a blanket to cover all of it, right? Yes, I think that's right. And the and do we know where it came from? So HIV was transmitted from monkeys, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there are a lot of viruses that are very similar to HIV. They're called SIVs, mm-hmm. and they live in all of these different monkey species. Uh, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, and for the monkeys that have these SIVs, they actually have this long evolutionary history with these viruses so that the monkeys themselves don't get sick. Mm -hmm. But what happened with HIV is that when people were hunting these monkeys and were butchering them, that virus from a chimpanzee um, is very similar and it was able to infect human cells. Um, and because of that, 
you then had the virus that, that ended up getting ramped up in, in human populations for, for all kinds of different reasons, but it started out as a monkey virus. In 1992, I was uh, teaching in Nigeria at the University of Baden. I was there on Fulbright. And um, at the time, uh, AIDS was rampant in uh, West Africa, but the most of the um, you know officials were in denial of this, and it was hidden, and it was an embarrassment, and uh, kind of the early, like it was here in the early days. And one of the things that I heard there a lot was uh, from the doctors there, is they said, well, AIDS is actually a U.S. military experiment gone bad that they're trying to blame on Africa. So this was a common notion at, at that time. Yeah, I have heard that before. There, I think any disease sparks these conspiracy theories, mm-hmm. and I think you know it, it also even goes to some extremes where you even have AIDS denialists who don't even believe it's a real disease, believe it's all mm-hmm. this big cover up. Um, but what we know from science is that this. This is a real virus that is connected to the disease. HIV does cause AIDS, and it is linked to these these early primate viruses. We know that HIV is really almost identical to the virus that's found in chimpanzees. So we have a very good sense of where this virus came from and how it became transmitted to humans. Well, the other unfortunate thing that happened, I think, in Africa and what helped, to, helped it spread there, uh, besides the lack of medical help and treatment and social embarrassment and all that was that uh, many of them believed, uh, since they saw so many white people with it, uh, they believed it was a, a typical white man problem. You know, they see the white man come to Africa and, and he is, uh, you know, put on his back very easily by malaria. And, uh, and yet they, you know, treat it like a cold. It's just they're, they're fine after a few days. And so they see it as a white man weakness. Uh, and so that was another thing that helped them uh, build what you might call that conspiracy theory. But uh, anyway, enough about that. Uh, let's dig into your book, which is, uh, which is beautifully written, just wonderfully written. So I congratulate you for that. You're, you have enormous talent in taking complicated matters and uh, putting it into a narrative that is compelling it reads it like a medical mystery, you know. It's it's beautiful. Oh, thank you. So let's talk about the two main characters here. Uh, we have uh, two people that you have followed who were cured. Uh, if we put uh, if we put it in brackets, because I know there's uh, uh, you know you're careful with the term cured. Let's talk about that just a minute, because most people believe that AIDS cannot be cured or HIV cannot be cured but uh, you're using the word carefully in a medical sense. Yes, I think that might be one of the most exciting parts of the book is the fact that we now have doctors and researchers that are no longer afraid to use the word cured when talking about HIV. That was not true for a long time. Even five years ago, it was difficult for doctors to use the C word. Mm -hmm. But in these cases, what these men have is called a functional cure. And this means that there's still a remnant of the virus that's in their bodies, but they're able to control it without any kind of medication. And so for these cases, it's, it's just gotten people very excited that for the first time we're able to really pursue HIV cure research in a way that we couldn't have even five years ago. Well, we would say that about any disease, wouldn't we? If you didn't have to take medicine for it anymore, wouldn't you consider yourself cured? Yes, I think for people living with HIV, the distinction is not important. But, of course, for researchers, it's important that we distinguish between a sterilizing cure, where we're able to eliminate any trace of the virus, and a functional cure, where there is some level of the virus. And the, and this, is, this level of the virus can only be detected by ultra-sensitive tests. Um, and so it's this level of the virus that then remains in the body. Um, but for both types of cures, the patient doesn't have to take any therapy and can live a long, healthy life, which is the most important thing. So your book follows two men who um, were part of the, they were called the Berlin patients, and they were cured. And you follow them through their treatment to uh, the point at which they are cured. And their names are, you use, uh, uh, Christian is uh, is a nom de plume, right? It's it's a it pseudonym. Is, yes. He wishes then, to remain anonymous. Okay. Yeah. And then Timothy is a real, that's his real name. Yes. Okay. 
So let's go, let's deal with Christian first and, and you know, go through the kind of uh, his biography. So Christian was a young man who was a student in Berlin. He was a German. And he went to his family doctor because he'd had sex at a party and was worried that he might have gotten HIV. And his family doctor, who was a man named Heiko Jensen, was, as soon as he saw Christian, he suspected that he might be infected. And so he did something unusual. He gave him a test that was able to detect HIV very early. So they were able to detect HIV within only a few days of him becoming infected. And then, even more unusual, he decided to give him this very aggressive and early therapy. So this was 1996. This wasn't typically how HIV was treated, but Heiko was looking to give his patients uh, a chance to be cured, essentially. You know, it's not where you typically think of HIV research as coming from. You usually think of it as coming from big labs and big researchers. But yes. here's the case of a family doctor who really wanted, who really believed in, in this idea that you can get the virus before it gets a foothold in the body and eliminate it. And so this is what he was going for. And so he gave Christian this aggressive mix of drugs and they were able to essentially clear the virus from his body. Christian then went off therapy against his doctor's advice at the end of 1996, and he hasn't gone back on therapy since then. So he's considered functionally cured of the virus. I was astounded when I read about uh, the extraordinary test that they performed on him to see if there was any of the virus left anywhere in his lymph nodes, and they were able to to find like one cell per billion <laughs> that was affected? Yes, it's even more than that. It's like one cell per 40 billion. Wow. I mean, they actually changed the way they did these. They made these ultra-sensitive tests in response to Christian's immune system. It's quite a compliment to an it immune is. system to say, well, we need to devise a whole new way to detect HIV just to find it in your body. <laughs> and that's how difficult it was to find the virus in him. So the key... Uh, you know, from Dr. Jensen's standpoint was that they needed to hop on it early before it got a foothold, so to speak. And those people, the traditional test that took a month to perform allowed AIDS to get a start. Is that right? That's exactly right. Yeah, so most people then, and, and even today actually, it, they typically give tests that measure the body's response to HIV mm -hmm. instead of measuring the virus itself. Mm -hmm. And so what this doctor did is quite different because he was looking to see if you could sort of give your immune system a head start and be able to attack HIV before it was able to have this, this month to, to, to prepare. Well, I was also thinking about the, the contribution of the family doctor. You know, as you pointed out, a lot of times you think of this research done in, in enormous labs at uh, pharmaceutical companies. And uh, or at you know great university, so you don't think about the family doctor practicing on the front lines, coming up with the you know the answer. And uh, but John Snow, I think uh, you know the great um, British doctor who had a lot to do with, I, I guess, developing uh, public health policies for cholera. You know, he was just a kind of a family doctor who decided, I I, I think I understand this. Very similar idea, isn't it? And it, it's interesting because you know, we're seeing such a drop in primary care and such a drop in medical students that decide to specialize in family medicine. And I, I think that is a problem. I mean, you you want to have these doctors that, that are able to look at their patients as you know, from every aspect and to look at them, look at the whole person and, and try to figure out therapies that are best for the individual involved. So when Dr. Jensen uh, developed um, his theory and some very strong proof for the theory, he still had trouble getting the medical community to pay attention, right? He did. So what Heiko Jensen did is he ended up going to just the leaders in the HIV field. So he got researchers that are famous in HIV to take his patient samples and to study them. And so what they did as a group was really collaborate to, to show that this man had been cured of HIV and to show why he had been cured. So they were able to show that, that his immune cells had this fantastic response to the virus that was able to, to clear it early in infection. Why did he have that, that 
tremendous uh, response to it that other people didn't have. Do they know? In some ways, we can't know. So we can postulate that by giving the therapy very early, that it may have given his body this head start. Mm -hmm. It's also given an experimental drug that um, it's very possible was able to, to purge HIV in kind of a unique way. Um, and it's possible that there are, there's been some controversy that there may be a genetic factor at play as well. So in some ways, we can actually never know exactly what happened with him. Mm -hmm. But what's most important is what's happened because of him and the clinical trials that have now built on his case and are now looking at these aspects of his cure and actually being able to replicate it in other people. Well, there is, do you think that in 10 years uh, we'll have no HIV patients taking uh, all these antiviral drugs? Do you think that we can actually have a true cure? I think within a decade we will. I absolutely do. And I'm not the only one. It's, mm -hmm. We're at a point now where we're no longer talking about if HIV will be cured, but when it will be cured. And this is just such an exciting turnaround for well, people researching the disease and, of course, for people living with the virus, too. Well, I tell you, as a layman, it blows my mind because I had always been told uh, by people I respected that, I mean, people in the, in the field of science, uh, that uh, there would never be a cure because it just mutates too much. Yes. I mean, there are many reasons why people thought HIV was incurable. One is that it mutates so much. One is that it's able to hide so well in the body. It's mm -hmm. able to hide in our bone marrow. It hides in our brain. It hides in mm -hmm. our lymph node. Um, so there are just many reasons why people thought that HIV could never be cured. And that's why these cases have had the impact they've had because it was very, it was almost impossible for people to pursue HIV cure research without having an example that they could point to that this could really be done. Now, in all the research that's done, is there any connection between, you know, ethnicity uh, or the genetics of ethnicity and uh, some sort of natural inoculative power? Uh, do, do black people fight it better or, um, you know, Indo-Europeans? Is there anything like that? Well, this actually gets to second Berlin patient mm -hmm. because his cure is related to a group of people in Europe. So about 1% of Western Europeans have a mutation. Uh. This mutation is called Delta 32, and this mutation protects people from HIV. People that have this mutation are perfectly healthy, but they are resistant to HIV. So there are certainly these genetic factors that are linked to how fast you progress to disease and even mutations that can completely protect you from the virus. Well, let's talk about uh, Timothy because his circumstance today is so vastly different from Christian in terms of the life they live. And uh, But Timothy is much more actively involved in, in uh, promoting uh, these advances. He is. He really is. So Timothy received, in 2007, he had cancer and HIV, mm. and he saw an oncologist. He was the first HIV patient that this oncologist had ever seen, and this physician had kind of a crazy idea. He thought, well, what if we can cure both his cancer and HIV at once? And so what he did was he gave Timothy a stem cell transplant from one of these people who have a mutation that makes them naturally resistant to HIV. And when he gave Timothy these cells, they repopulated his body, and they made his immune system then resistant to HIV. So HIV can't enter the cells in Timothy's body. And he's now been off therapy since 2007. Um, it's a much different experience coming back from cancer and HIV. And this has taken a toll on Timothy. Um, but like the first Berlin patient, before him, his experience has had such a dramatic effect on medicine and has, has really influenced a number of exciting clinical trials that we have now. I compared him, or at least couldn't help but compare him to the Henrietta Lacks uh, experience. I mean, Henrietta died, and yet her cells lived on, so to speak, and a lot of research was done from these cells. And she and her family made nothing. And Timothy is like that, right? He, he donates his tissue and his blood samples, and he's the subject of much inquiry, and um, yet he gets nothing. Yes, that's so true. I mean, Timothy, of course, has benefited from Henrietta Lacks mm -hmm. because 
you know, because of her story, you know, we do have these much better consent laws. Mm-hmm. So Timothy is properly consented for all these procedures that he undergoes, but what he goes through is very difficult. You know, he has, he's gotten multiple biopsies in his gut mm-hmm. and lumbar punctures, so they've, you know, put lots of needles in, in his spine. He does a lot of blood draws. He does lymph node biopsies. He undergoes an incredible amount of procedures to be able to give us the data that he has. And he really hasn't received hardly anything in return. I mean, just the barest amount that someone can survive on. Um, So, you know, things are getting better for Timothy now. He is starting to, you know, he's been able to pull in a lot more advocacy for HIV cure research. Mm -hmm. This story is so powerful that it it really has brought people to pay attention to what's happening. Um, And he, he is he is doing much better now than he was when he really several times almost died during yes. procedures. Um, but now he is, he's much happier. He has a he has a long term boyfriend, mm-hmm. and you know, he's, he's he's living life much happier than he was in two thousand nine. <laughs> well, that's great because when I read this, it made me want to start you know the Timothy Brown Foundation or something to help him because so uh, he does have uh, a foundation. Mm-hmm. He does have a Timothy Brown Foundation. Um, and certainly, you know, things are, are not perfect mm-hmm. for him, but what, he, what he's given science is, is quite amazing. Well, then I'll send some money to his foundation because he's doing great things. Yeah, the, it really is. Now, you met with him, right? With, uh, you, you interviewed him? Oh, yeah. I spent a lot of time with Timothy and with Christian and with both of their physicians as well. Mm-hmm. I felt like it was very important to tell the personal side of their stories because they're such great stories. They're not what you expect in medicine. These aren't the big clinical trials from big research labs, although I discussed that in the book as mm-hmm. well. But their stories are, are very personal and very endearing. They're two very brave men that just went through so much and have such an interesting perspective on, on what it means to be cured of HIV. Well, it, you know, it, it's a dual biography uh, of not only these brave men, but uh, of the disease itself and and the evolution of our response to it uh, uh, from a research perspective and a societal perspective. So that's why it's such a, a beautiful read. It humanizes. Oh, it humanizes the you know the, the illness and puts a human face on it. And that's that's what you have to do to get people to uh, to care. I think. And one of the things I think that's a, go ahead. I was just going to say I think it's it's important that you do that for physicians and researchers as well. I, I think it's important to realize that people are human and that there are these fundamental human reasons for, for why people pursue the research they do and, and, and give the therapies they give to their patients. And it does come back to, to sometimes unlikely stories. You know, I think for Heiko Jensen, who treated the first Berlin patient, you know, his giving that therapy to Christian was born out of his own scare with HIV. So it's mm-hmm. important that we look at these aspects to researchers and physicians as well as patients. I think that um, one of the elements that will surprise many people is the the degree to which uh, the egos clash on the publishing of papers and to the fight over who's going to be first author and second author and all of that. Uh, for those of us with an academic background, it's not terribly surprising, but it, it seems a little surprising given the uh, significance of what they are studying that, you know, you would think that, that the ego element would get pushed aside and, and they would just be interested in sharing uh, the good story. Yes. It, you know, I think, you know, for yourself, for other people that are in academia, it may not be surprising. Um, but for those that are outside the field, it, it perhaps is surprising how cutthroat these studies can be. And, <laughs> yes. and just, you know, how much... How much is at stake when publishing an article in the New England Journal of Medicine? Um, and so for both of these patients, what's interesting is that both papers were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and in both cases, there was just an incredible clash of egos, competition, all kinds of sneaky, backstabbing things happened on the route to publication for both of these stories. And when you talk to the doctors involved in all of this, uh, after some years for perspective, uh, did did they say, "Well, I'm a you know sad that it went that way," or "I'm sorry it got confused," or is there some sort of apology for it all? Absolutely, mm-hmm. yes. For in both of these cases, that's exactly the response. People people feel badly about about how it went, and 
you know, I think you have a, a few years to gain some perspective, and mm-hmm. it, it softens your, your outlook on who should get credit in a paper and, and what it means to a career mm-hmm. in a way that you can't properly assess when you're in the middle of all of it. Well, the most important thing and the most exciting thing, of course, is the title of your book, Cured. The idea that uh, these millions of people worldwide might be able to get off of these drugs one day. And, uh, of course, the drugs themselves have given them uh, a life of relative normalcy, which they didn't anticipate in you know 1985. They just thought we're going to have people dropping like flies. So it sustained them until the cure, uh, if, if we get there. And I'm hope- obviously hopeful that we do. So you think 10 years? That's what I think. So I spent a lot of time in the book talking about what's in clinical trials right now and what some of this early data looks like. You know, the most important thing is that we find therapies that are effective but are also safe. And Mm -hmm. so it's finding this right balance, making sure that they work, making sure that they won't hurt anyone. Um, And this this is what's happening right now. And it's happening... Interestingly, in different ways, it's happening in gene therapy trials, and it's also happening in these eradication studies. Mm -hmm. We now have some other individuals that have been cured of HIV. We have um, another group of men that were given therapy very early after HIV infection that are functionally cured. And we have a, a baby in Mississippi who was given an early aggressive therapy on her second day of life and is now a, a healthy three-year-old toddler. Wow, that's great. So I think this, it, it is great. And I think, you know, this is, this is what we're going for. We're looking for how these stories will, will just keep adding up and we'll keep having more people that, that get to experience this going off therapy and being functionally cured of HIV. So your message to people, I suppose, anybody who might suspect that they've been exposed or could have contracted uh, AIDS is to get help fast. The great thing now is that people can get tested at home. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait a month. You don't Mm -hmm. have to even go to the doctor. You can go to the drugstore and get a home HIV test. Um, So anyone that that has any fears, they don't even have to go to a doctor now. Although it's still, of course, good to go see a a family doctor if you can. Um, But, yeah, no, this is definitely part of a message is that the, the care that we give, and, and especially primary care that we give to everyone, and especially those with HIV, is, is important. What are the top clinics in America for AIDS treatment research now? There's a number of really great clinics. So here in Boston, where I live, we have some great research that's happening at Massachusetts General Hospital. Mm-hmm. We have a big clinic there with uh, a large HIV-positive population. There's the wonderful work that's being done at University of California, San Francisco, at San Francisco General Hospital. There's a big clinic there. There's some really exciting clinical trials. Mm -hmm. At the University of Pennsylvania, there's a big clinic and some very exciting clinical trials that are happening Mm -hmm. there as well. So Mm -hmm. all around the country, there is just exciting work being done. Well, thank you, Dr. Holt, for joining us today. And this has been a, a really quick 30 minutes. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I think you've done a, a great deal of good in terms of helping people see, um, you know, that there's a bright future here. And uh, AIDS will not be the scourge that we thought it once would be. And medical science, again, to the rescue. The book is called Cured, How the Berlin Patients Defeated HIV and Forever Changed Medical Science by Nathalia Holt. Pick it up. It's a wonderful read. And thank you, Dr. Holt, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Quite welcome. Good luck with the book. Signing off, I'm Dr. W.F. Strong, hoping that all your books are good reads. Thank you.